Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dawn Burnett, and I am the site coordinator at Patrick Henry Scotchtown Museum, located in Hanover County, Virginia. I would like to welcome you today as we go to the source and discover how historic and primary source documents reveal what life may have been like at two of Patrick Henry's uh, homes, Scotchtown and Red Hill. Scotchtown dates to around 1719 and was Mr. Henry's home from 1771 to 1778. It is from Scotchtown that he rode to Richmond's St. John's Church and delivered his famous Liberty or Death speech and would be elected the first governor of the newly formed Commonwealth of Virginia. Red Hill, located in Brookhill, Virginia, is the final home and burial place of Patrick Henry. Patrick and his family lived at Red Hill from 1796 until his death in 1799, though the land stayed in the Henry family until 1945, when the Patrick Henry Memorial Foundation was formed to maintain the site. We would like to thank everyone for joining us today. This collaborative program is only possible through generous donations from all of our supporters. If you enjoyed this program, we do ask that you consider making a donation to one of our sites. I have included the links for those for your convenience and reference in the chat box below. No amount is too small and they really do make a difference. All sites have amazing calendars of events upcoming and I encourage you to visit redhill.org and scotchtown.org to look and see what's coming up. We are also asking for your help in tracking today's attendance by adding your name, where you're from, along with how many are viewing us from your link to the chat box below. We should have some time at the end of the program for Q&A, so please feel free to ask those questions and put them in the Q&A box. I now have the great privilege of introducing you to our speakers. Our speakers today are all experienced educators and historians who have thoughtfully and carefully studied the documents they will be presenting. Leah Lane has been the Curator of Collections at Preservation Virginia for the past year and a half. Prior to that, she worked as an Assistant Curator of the Cincinnati Art Museum. Leah has a BA in History from the University of Virginia and a Master of Arts from the University of Delaware's Winterthur Program at, in American Material Culture. Erin Turbeville is a historic interpreter at Patrick Henry Scotchtown. She received her degree in history and anthropology from William and Mary in January of 2020. While there, she received a certificate in material culture and museum studies from the National Institute of American History and democracy held museum internships in historic interpretation and collections management. In August, she will continue her studies at the University of Delaware as a master's candidate in history with a graduate certificate in museum studies as the next steps towards her goal of pursuing a career in the museum field. Mark Cuvion, received his degree in history and archaeology from Longwood College. He has spent the last 35 years in the museum field, working as a researcher and historical interpreter at Red Hill, Jamestown, and Colonial Williamsburg. He has spent over 40 years studying Patrick Henry and has written numerous articles and four books on the Patriot including Patrick Henry's Virginia in 2001 and Patrick Henry, the, the Demosthenes of his age in 2013. He is currently working on a new book, which I'm very excited about, titled In Sickness and in Health, The Marriage of Patrick Henry and Sarah Shelton. This will focus on Sarah Henry's struggle with mental illness. Lastly, Caitlin Curtis is the Director of Education and Donor Systems at Patrick Henry's Red Hill. She was born and raised in Ohio, but has lived in Virginia for the past eight years. Caitlin is a graduate of Liberty University and holds a BS in Social Sciences with teacher licensure, as well as an MA in History. She has been a member of the Red Hill staff for over five years, building educational resources 
connecting with teachers, homeschool families and students, scheduling living history field trips and tours, and helping with data management and development. It is now my pleasure to turn over the program to our first guest speaker, Ms. Erin Turberville. Thank you very much, Dawn, for that introduction. I'm going to share my screen and get started. All right. So I'm gonna jump right in and introduce you to the main primary source that I and our curator, Leah Lane, have been analyzing for the past few months, a ledger with about 1,000 entries that records all of the purchases Patrick Henry made at his half-brother John Sims Newcastle store between the years of 1771 and 1778. The majority of the purchases were recorded between 1771 and 1775. So given that these years correlate more or less exactly with the years at which Patrick Henry lived at Scotchtown, this is an excellent source of information to give us a sense of some of the personal and household purchases he made for his time there. So why was this ledger created? It appears that John Sim, whose store was in the town of Newcastle, suggested Patrick owed him more than Patrick believed was accurate. In order to prove that he was not underpaying, Patrick requested that the purchases he'd made at the store in the past be recorded in one consolidated ledger. The original document is held at the Library of Congress who have kindly shared a high quality scan of the document with us for this project. So one of the first things that caught my eye in scanning the ledger were some of the food purchases. While certainly not all of the food that the residents of Scotchtown ate is accounted for in the purchases from the Newcastle store, scattered throughout the ledger are both substantial purchases of more essential foods like bushels of salt or 100 pounds of flour at one time, as well as expensive imported treats like almonds, coffee, and chocolate. Comparing the costs of one pound of almonds to 100 pounds of flour, we can see the extreme difference in the affordability of these goods. So the flour purchased here cost about five times as much as the almond purchase, while the quantity of flour is about 100 times as much as the quantity of almonds. So this indicates, indicates to us that Patrick Henry was a man of means who was able to and chose to use expendable income on luxury items when he and his family wished to do so. Now looking closely, we notice one particular time period in which Patrick purchased a large number of different delicacies in large quantities. In late September, 1773, Patrick purchased one pound of chocolate, three pounds of plums, three pounds of almonds, and a whopping 200 herrings. In addition, he purchased a large china bowl and three pewter dishes in that same time period. Though we can't be sure, the china bowl pictured here, currently exhibited at Scotchtown, could possibly be the bowl referred to in this ledger entry, as it does have a provenance of ownership by Patrick Henry. Now the timing and size of these purchases suggests that he was preparing for some kind of banquet, undoubtedly with the addition of food from the Scotchtown kitchen garden, livestock, and purchases from other local merchants. Now what could this banquet have been for? Well, Patrick and his wife, Sarah's eldest daughter, Patsy, married John Fontaine on October 2nd, 1773. And family tradition and research by Mark Cuvion, who you'll hear from shortly, suggests Patsy's wedding may well have taken place at Scotchtown. So perhaps Patrick's purchases at this time were to provide his daughter and her guests with an elegant array of food during her wedding. While these purchases can be understood as objects of pleasure and consumption for Patrick Henry and his upper-class guests, they can also be considered in another manner, as an element of the labor experience of the enslaved individuals at Scotchtown. While Patrick purchased the food, it was most likely an enslaved cook who prepared it into meals for the visitors and enslaved domestic servants who served the guests from the pewter dishes. We know much less about the individuals enslaved at Scotchtown than about Patrick Henry and his family. We don't even know all of their names, but an analysis of primary sources gives us opportunities to learn more about them, which we're working every day to do. With knowledge of the tasks enslaved people performed and a sense of the size and makeup of the enslaved population at Scotchtown, we start to notice more and more ledger entries that would have directly affected the lives of the enslaved people there. <clears throat> 
1768 tithable list from Roundabout Plantation, Patrick's home immediately prior to Scotchtown, is an important primary source that gives us the names of 10 individuals enslaved by Patrick just three years before his move to Scotchtown. Their names are Pedro, Dinah, Ben, Beck, Ben, Jenny, Dick, James, Isaac, and Will. Because of how soon this record was made before Patrick moved his household to Scotchtown, we expect that most, if not all, of these 10 people were brought with him there. Pedro is referenced in the Newcastle store ledger, as you can see here. And as Dinah and Beck are recorded on an inventory taken of Patrick's home at Red Hill after his death, we can be fairly certain that they were enslaved by Patrick continuously, at least between 1768 and 1799, including at Scotchtown. Now we estimate that around 10 individuals at Scotchtown were enslaved as domestic servants, including the aforementioned cook. It is likely that she was the primary preparer of the foods purchased by Patrick for that fall 1773 event. And we can extend that to expect that most of the food purchases throughout the ledger were handled and prepared by her. Now, what tools would she have used to prepare the foods? The ledger provides some insight here as well. In April 1773, Patrick purchased a frying pan and in August 1773, a saucepan and a large pot, perhaps something like those pictured here. These tools were then primarily and frequently used by the cook in order to prepare all of the meals for the Henry family and their guests, as well as those for herself and the other enslaved people. Now, other kinds of purchases tell us more about the range of work performed by enslaved individuals. Throughout the ledger, we find purchases of materials necessary for construction, including these purchases of 250 nails and 12 panes of glass in November 1774, and the purchases of a large number of woodworking tools, including an adze, a handsaw, and a gauge in August 1774. It was common for enslaved men to perform much of the labor of construction during this period of plantation houses, outbuildings, and public buildings. The Manor House of Scotchtown was likely originally built and expanded in part by enslaved people. And though the house was complete by the time Patrick Henry moved in, these ledger purchases may indicate maintenance work on the main house, as well as the construction of outbuildings nearby, such as perhaps a kitchen building, laundry building, and living quarters for the enslaved. Purchases multiple times per year tell us construction work was going on fairly frequently at Scotchtown, and looking at the dates of purchases, we see that some things were bought in the heat of August and the cold of February. So if these purchases were for immediate demands, these are also the conditions in which the enslaved builders would have worked. Reading between the lines of these entries allows us to do more than just consider with what materials the structures at Scotchtown were built, but also to consider the people who were sawing the boards and nailing the shingles who did the work that allowed Patrick Henry to live comfortably in this home and built the structures in which they themselves would live and work as well. Now, in addition to the enslaved people who worked as domestic servants at Scotchtown, we estimate Patrick Henry enslaved between 20 and 30 people as field laborers. Scotchtown was an active plantation and Patrick Henry gained his wealth in part from the sale of cash crops of tobacco and wheat that were grown and harvested by the enslaved people there. And ledger entries reflect the cycle of profit and purchase essential to his status as a planter, a cycle that did not function without the forced contribution of enslaved laborers. In May, 7, in May 1772, for example, we see the purchase of five broad hoes, followed later that year by spades, a shovel, and multiple scythes, all of which would have been used in agricultural work at Scotchtown. The profits Patrick made from the work of the enslaved people enabled him to buy these tools, tools which were then used by the same individuals to harvest more cash crops, earning Henry a profit. And so that cycle continued. Another painful part of that cycle was the purchase and sale of enslaved people. In fact, another primary source includes direct examples of this occurring to Henry's benefit. A ledger located at the Library of Virginia that records payments to Patrick for law services includes a John Hicks from Hanover County who it appears in 1771 paid Patrick in part either by selling or giving Patrick ownership of two enslaved women, Lucy and Hannah. 
of the lives of enslaved people were not defined by their labor, though this is the primary aspect of their lives that I've discussed. This is because the major connections we could draw between purchases in this ledger and the lives of the enslaved at Scotchtown are related to their labor. And that is informative of their situation and relationship with Patrick Henry. As the enslaver of these individuals, Patrick Henry's purchases connected to them are generally purchases that benefited him, whether because they enabled his food to be cooked, his house to be fixed, or the crops he profited from to be grown. But in reading the ledger with a view on the enslaved, we're able to bring the people actually doing this work into the forefront and to recognize their impact on Patrick's daily life and on the environment at Scotchtown. And with that, I'm going to pass the torch to Preservation Virginia curator, Leah Lane, to speak more to this topic. Thank you, Erin. That was an excellent introduction to this ledger, which Erin um, has been an amazing help in an analyzing and transcribing over these past, uh, it's really been on six months, eight months, we've been really working on it. So i um, really grateful for that. So we are so lucky to have the information that's in that sim ledger. Um, there are surprisingly few sources uh, that directly address life at Scotchtown in the 1770s. There are almost no letters that survive from Patrick Henry uh, that we believe were written from the property. Now, fortunately, a letter that he penned on January 18th, 1773 is among those survivors. It helps us consider one of the great apparent paradoxes at play in the life of Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry, the orator of the revolution and a champion of liberty, was an enslaver. So how do we grapple with this and how did he? Henry wrote the 1773 letter to Virginia Quaker and abolitionist Robert Pleasance. It packs a punch and it was reprinted over and over during the 19th century in abolitionist publications to show that the revolutionary hero was aghast at the denial of liberty inherent in the institution of slavery. A little bit of backstory. So Virginia Quaker abolitionist identified Patrick Henry as an influential leader in the late 1760s. We know several met with him in person to advocate for the cause. And the thinking was this, by winning over a man on the rise like Henry, they could push through real change and the restrictive legislation that made private manumission or the legal freeing of an enslaved person uh, nearly impossible in the colony. In 1769, Henry saw one of his friends and fellow legislators, Robert Bland, or Richard Bland, attend to make just such a proposal which had immediate and strong pushback from Virginia elites. So this is a dangerous political move. But men like Robert Pleasance and women too, were not easily dissuaded. Sometime in late 1772 or in early 1773, Pleasance sent Henry some of the writings of the leading Philadelphia abolitionist, Anthony Benizet. The letter from Scotchtown was in thanks for those publications. And I would encourage you to read this letter in full. I'm actually a little bit later gonna drop a link to it in uh, the chat box. So um, definitely take a look and read it in full. So in this letter, Henry is walking a fine line. He's seen the fallout of trying to push for the easing and manumission restrictions, and he's not yet at the peak of his political influence, but he's also well aware of the gap between his high-minded rhetoric and his continued enslavement of human beings. To, to quote Henry, is it not amazing that at a time when the rights of humanity are defined and understood with precision in a country above all others fond of liberty, that in such an age and in such a country, we find men professing a religion the most humane, mild, meek, gentle, and generous, adopting a principle as repugnant to humanity as it is inconsistent with the Bible and destructive to liberty. And he turns to his own culpability in this. He says, would anyone believe that I am the master of slaves of my own purchase? I am drawn along by the general inconvenience of living without them. I will not, I cannot justify it. Henry's letter ultimately treats the abolition of slavery as the just cause of religious groups like the Quakers, while quietly excusing his own inaction. Like other enslavers, he makes the argument that to quote, treat the unhappy victims with leniency is the furthest advance that we can make towards justice. Now, Pleasance didn't give up on Henry. If anything, this letter encouraged him and they carried on a correspondence into the 1790s. 
Pleasants even planned to visit Scotchtown in February of 1774, though it's not clear if he actually made the trip. He lived in Henrico County, which is right around Richmond, so it's not very far, far away at all. Likely he did. Now, when the Virginia delegates set off for the First Continental Congress, Pleasant sent letters of introduction, like the one shown here on the screen, uh, to Benazé, specifically singling Henry out as a potential ally for their efforts. But as Aaron has shown, the letter reveals the persistence of slavery at Scotchtown, and it gives us a way to compare his rhetoric with the reality. If the furthest advance towards justice Henry could muster in the 1770s was to treat the unhappy victims as well as possible, is there evidence of that in the ledger? So let's talk about textiles and clothing. Now by law, enslavers had to provide clothing for the enslaved, whether in finished garments or in raw materials. Based on the ledger, Henry opted for the latter. In fact, the very first purchase on the Sim ledger, shown here in the top left, was for Osnaburg, sometimes written Osnaburg or Osnabrig. Um, that's an unbleached, coarse linen that's cheap and durable, but plain and uncomfortable. It scratched and it irritated the skin, and it had to be worn in over time. This was the main textile used for the clothing of the enslaved in the colonies, especially those who worked in the fields. Other yardage of slightly higher grades recorded in the ledger were likely used for clothing worn by those enslaved within the domestic setting. During their time at Scotchtown, the Henry household purchased quantities of thimbles, needles, and thread that were well in excess of what a family that ranged between six and eight members uh, would require. And the surplus implements were possibly distributed among the enslaved community, along with textiles. For example, the ledger shows that over 700 needles were purchased between 1772 and 1774. And that's really the frame when most of the purchases on the ledger happened. And what was likely a means to reduce cost, Henry provided the raw materials and the implements to the enslaved to sew their own garments rather than finished wares. The textiles were coarse and designed for durability rather than comfort. And the enslaved community certainly added to these with their own purchases. Perhaps they dyed these goods, but that's not reflected in this particular document we're looking at. There are limits to the considerations Henry made towards the treatment of the people that he held in bondage. The vast majority of the purchases in the ledger are for some form of textile or textile related tool. Hundreds of yards of linen, silk, wool, buttons, thread, uh, ribbons, gloves, and even the occasional complete garment. Now, most of these things were imported from England. But remember, this is early 1770s in Virginia and the revolution is brewing. Henry's household consumption, dependent on the importation of English goods, began to be in tension with the political activity of Henry himself. Henry was selected as a delegate to the First Continental Congress held in Philadelphia from September 5th to, to October 26th of 1774. And on October 20th, he was among those who signed the Continental Association, which among other things, banned importation and the consumption of imported goods from Great Britain starting on December 1st. Although imported goods already in the country could be purchased, there was an obvious fear of scarcity and of price gouging. So upon Henry's return to Scotchtown by late November, there is a massive uptick in the purchases recorded in the Sim ledger to the point where he's charged for the wagonage of molasses, rum, and sugar, three items that had not previously been associated with any transportation costs in this ledger, and three items whose availability was about to drop precipitously with the enforcement of this boycott. Now, Scotchtown was probably a stressful place in the fall of 1774, not just because of political turmoil or brewing boycotts. We can see in this letter written from the house on October 15th that Henry's sister Annie laments the continued absence of her brother, especially given that, quote, his wife is extremely ill. Whenever we try to reconstruct the lives of free and enslaved individuals at Scotchtown, it's equally important to consider the primary sources we have and those we don't have. The quote I just read you is a rare moment when we hear about Sarah, Patrick Henry's wife. We believe that the illness referenced in the letter is a mental one, a long struggle with an undetermined mental disorder in the years after the birth of her, her last child, Edward or Nettie. In the mid 19th century, the son of the doctor who cared for Sarah recalled further details about her confinement at Scotchtown 
But these recollections were made many decades after both Sarah and Patrick had passed away. And as uh, Don mentioned, Mark is actually coming out with a book very soon on Sarah. And we're all really looking forward to, to digging into that. Uh, so thank you, Mark, for all your work on this. And we believe Sarah died in the late winter or early spring of 1775, but even this is only speculation. And there's really nothing in this period in the ledger that we can definitively connect with her passing. It is worth noting that later in that year, in October, the household purchased two yards of black crepe. Remember that Continental Association? It also restricted the kinds of mourning practices you could carry out. And among the narrow range of acceptable ways you could show your sadness, your mourning, was an arm brand of black crepe. The ledger begins to trail off in 1775, and that's a year of momentous importance to the life of Patrick Henry. As we said, Sarah's death probably occurs early in that year. In March, leading Virginians filed into St. John's Church to debate the escalating political crisis in the colonies. And it was from that building on March 23rd that Henry gave the speech that launched his career into the stratosphere, calling out for liberty or death. Now, perhaps he felt the eyes of his fellow soon-to-be countrymen on him. Maybe he was feeling a little less than fashionable, given the fresh attention. Because on March 30th, seven days after the speech, somebody purchased all the makings of a fine suit of wool clothes. Less than two months later, Henry led a small militia to the capital of Williamsburg, determined to retrieve or receive compensation for the gunpowder Lord Dunmore had attempted to spirit away from the magazine. And perhaps he had on that silver button coat when he rode north into Maryland to the cheers of his supporters and onward to the Second Continental Congress to once again stake its place among the leaders of the coming revolution. So this is where we close our chapter with Scotchtown. Um, but as Mark and Caitlin will explore now, the story is really far from over. Yes, when it comes to um, primary sources that we use at Red Hill to try to piece together Patrick Henry's time there, uh, there's basically four sources that we go to. Uh, one is the inventory. Um, we have an inventory taken in 1799, about a month after Patrick Henry's passing, and another one taken in 1802 of the property. Uh, also the ledger book, which uh, you brought up, uh, it spans the years of 1758 to 1795, uh, also letters to and from Patrick Henry, and uh, court records from Charlotte County and uh, Campbell County. Uh, Patrick Henry, he actually had 13 different homes before he moves to Red Hill at the age of 57. Uh, he would have five different homes between Scotchtown and Red Hill. Typically, he didn't live in a house more than about five years before moving on. Um, his brother-in-law, Samuel Meredith, uh, remarked that Henry would change his dwelling with as little concern as a common man would change his coat, of which he was tired. Now, if you look at the Charlotte County court records, uh, we know that Patrick Henry purchased Red Hill from Richard Booker on March 14, 1794, and that he paid 1,700 pounds for the 700-acre plantation. That would be about $241,000 today, uh, roughly. Uh, from Henry's ledger book, uh, it shows that he's paying Booker for Red Hill uh, in cash, uh, credit and uh, legal services. Also, uh, looking at his ledger book, we see that he hires a free worker uh, to whitewash the buildings at Red Hill to make what ready for their arrival. Uh, even though Patrick Henry's in retirement at Red Hill, he's no longer in the legislature. He just finished writing the district court circuit. Uh, much of his time there is spent looking after his plantation. And um, from these primary sources, we get a good idea of how he was making money in retirement, um, tobacco being his main source of income. 
uh, looking at Hemery's private letters, which survive uh, in the New York Library, uh, it shows that he was growing or producing over 20,000 pounds of tobacco leaf a year at Red Hill. Uh, he was also producing 17,000 pounds of tobacco from his Long Island plantation, which sat about 18 miles from Red Hill. And another 8,000 pounds of tobacco from his Seven Islands plantation, which stood across the river from Red Hill in Halifax County. So between Red Hill and Long Island, he has about 8,000 acres of land along the Stanton River. And that land would eventually be divided amongst his uh, children upon his death. But uh, if you put the three uh, plantations together, that means he's producing over 45,000 pounds of tobacco a year, which uh, he's shipping to market in Lynchburg and Richmond. Uh, other source of income, second largest source at Red Hill uh, was his whiskey distillery operation. Uh, that's something that really hasn't been uh, looked into much until lately, but there's a lot of primary sources to uphold uh, his distillery uh, and activities. Uh, from personal letters, um, we know that he began operating his stills at Red Hill by 1795. And we also know that he was growing rye, corn, and barley at Red Hill and his Long Island plantation to keep those stills running. At this time period, whiskey was primarily made of rye and not corn. 60% rye, about 35% corn, and about 5% barley would be the mixture at, at Red Hill. Uh, court records show that he obtained a license to operate three stills at Red Hill for five months out of the year. So he's producing probably around one to 2,000 gallons of whiskey. And what is he doing with all this whiskey? Uh, his ledger book shows that he is selling whiskey to uh, local merchants, uh, tavern keepers, neighbors. Um, and we know the price he was selling it for was six shillings uh, a gallon. And no doubt he was using the whiskey uh, for slave rations as well at, at Red Hill. And of course, uh, he wouldn't be able to uh, make these, uh, the whiskey or grow tobacco without enslaved labor. Uh, we know at the time of his death, Patrick Henry owned 98 slaves. Uh, he had 67 slaves at Red Hill, 31 enslaved people at Long Island, and he was running 10 more at Seven Islands. Uh, his 1802 inventory kind of breaks down their ages. Uh, of the slaves at Red Hill, 31 were children under the age of 12. I know a lot of guests think that when they hear 67 slaves, they all think of adults in the prime of their life, but this shows uh, the majority being children. Uh, 11 of them were listed as old and infirm. Uh, nine were between the ages of 12 and 16, and uh, only 18 were listed as in the prime of life. And in 18th century, that typically meant from uh, 16 to 30. Uh, for an enslaved person, prime of life. Uh, unfortunately, their occupations are not listed. We can make uh, some uh, assumptions. Jesse, for instance, uh, he was the most expensive enslaved person on the inventory, listed at 200 pounds. So we think that he was a skilled craftsman, uh, probably a blacksmith or cooper. Uh, Shadrach uh, listed on the inventory. We know from a letter written by Patrick Henry's second wife, Dorothea, in 1800, uh, she mentioned sending Shadrach to pick up one of her sons at Hampton Sydney College. So he appears to have been uh, the coachman. Uh, already mentioned earlier, Dinah and Beck, uh, being two, two enslaved uh, women that go back to 
uh, probably uh, 1754 likely came with uh, uh, Sarah's dowry, wedding dowry to the marriage. So they were with Patrick Henry, most likely from the time he was 18 until his death at the age of 63 in 1799. Uh, in Henry's will that was written in 1798, and that's in the Charlotte County court records, uh, he gives Dorothea the option of choosing 20 slaves uh, for her choosing. Uh, the other not, uh, 78 slaves were to be divided amongst their surviving children. And uh, although Patrick Henry never freed any of his slaves during his lifetime, he did give Dorothea the right to free one or two slaves uh, upon his death. And looking at the court records, we see that Dorothea freed four. Their names were Reuben, Betty, Phyllis, and Nancy. Now also looking at the uh, inventory, we get an idea of the leisure activities at Red Hill. Uh, found amongst the inventory list is a piano forte. And we know from uh, various sources, contemporary sources, that Patrick Henry played the piano, harpsichord, violin, flute, and uh, even the lute. Uh, he also had a backgammon table on the inventory, uh, also a chariot, a uh, riding chair, men and women's uh, riding saddles. And that's something we see in the letters. Oftentimes, uh, Patrick Henry's uh, children are hitting to homes of family members in King William County, uh, Hanover County, King and Queen County, and Lynchburg to visit uh, relatives. Uh, also, the inventory shows uh, him having a tea set, obviously for Dorothea to entertain, with uh, 10 China teacups listed as well. Had three guns, uh, most likely for uh, hunting. And uh, about 220 books are listed on his inventory, and they cover a variety of topics from history, uh, geography, uh, religion, and novels. And from um, the Virginia State Library, there's about two dozen poems written by Patrick Henry's children that still survive. Uh, many of those poems are noted being uh, um, written at Red Hill. And from uh, one source, we know that Patrick Henry wrote poetry himself and also taught his children. And this primary source backs that up. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it to, uh, um, let's see, I think I'm finished with everything. I'll turn it over to Caitlin. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I'm going to cover three big themes that um, we can glean about Patrick's life from his time at Red Hill. So I'm going to share my screen with you and hopefully you can see a lovely picture of Red Hill that was taken from the air. But as Mark mentioned, um, we are very fortunate to have the 1799 and 1802 inventories. And what they show about Patrick, which I find very interesting because it's almost opposite to what Patrick was like at Scotchtown is that as Patrick got older and um, his later life being here at Red Hill, he became much more frugal. And so we can see from the 1799 and the 1802 inventories, all of the broken and worn items that Patrick had here. So for example, four large iron pots with cracks and holes, four Dutch ovens with broken lids, one iron tea kettle hole in the top, one iron tea kettle without top or handle. And as Mark mentioned, the China teacups um, in the inventory, it is listed 10 China teacups with and saucers of broken sets, eight China coffee cups and saucers, the cups cracked and without handles chiefly, four pair and irons much injured, three men's saddles very much worn, and three looking glasses, two somewhat injured and small. And those actually date back to his time at Scotchtown. Samuel Meredith, who was um, Patrick's 
in-law. He was married to Patrick's sister Jane and one of Patrick's oldest friends told William Wirt, who was Patrick's first biographer, that Patrick's furniture was all the plainest sort, consisting of necessaries only, nothing for show or ornament. This is echoed when Spencer Roan talked to William Wirt as well when Wirt was writing his biography. Um, Spencer Roan was married to Patrick's daughter, Anne, and Spencer Roan said about Patrick, his dress was plain, as also was his house and furniture, and he was careless about his diet. So based on what Mark said, Patrick certainly had land, certainly had money. He could have lived a more prominent lifestyle, similar to his lifestyle at Scotchtown. Um, but these sources talking about how frugal Patrick was here at Red Hill um, certainly say otherwise. By the time Patrick moved to Red Hill, um, he was in the decline of life. Red Hill is his burial place um, in which the graves can still be viewed today, but he had been in declining health for quite some time. So before June 6, 1799, which was the date of his passing, he had been suffering for several months. Um, Spencer Roan even told William Wirt that Patrick was in a gradual decline for about two years prior to that. So in a letter uh, from Patrick in his own words to Philip Payne in March 1798, over a year before he passed, Henry mentioned that what kept him from going to Long Island, the Long Island plantation, as Mark said, is about 18 miles away. Um, he said, I am afraid to ride out on account of my health. Now, 18 miles would be a little less than a day's journey on horseback, which from um, where Red Hill is with how rural it is, that really was not that strenuous of a trip. Um, but Patrick certainly feared his declining health even that early. In April of 1799, Patrick writes to Robert Campbell and said, a complaint like the gravel has rendered it impossible for me to ride out today. I apply today to Dr. Cabell for medical aid. Now gravel is not a modern term, um, but that meant that he had pains very similar to gallstones. About 15 days later on April 16th, he writes to President John Adams and he says, I have been confined for several weeks by a severe indisposition and am so sick as scarcely to be able to write this. As his state further declined, he wrote in May 1799 to his daughter, Martha Fontaine, and he said, Dear Patsy, I am very unwell and Dr. Cabell is with me. This would be the second time that Dr. Cabell was with Patrick just in those few months. The next source, um, Patrick writes to Thomas Reed in the beginning of May 1799 again, and he says, he ends his letter with P.S my health being very much impaired, I will thank you for an answer. So one of the other family members who was actually with Patrick at the time of his death wrote later on in 1820 that the day before Patrick's death, friends mentioned to him they hoped he was getting better. His reply was that before tomorrow I shall be in heaven. His declaration was fulfilled for before that time the next day he was in eternity. The illness that Patrick was stricken with is impossible to know. Um, he didn't have surgery or an autopsy done. Um, we know it was some sort of intestinal blockage or as Edward Fontaine would say in his manuscript, into susception. What we know about the death comes from the Fontaine manuscript, which was penned in 1872. It's currently housed at Cornell University and was virtually forgotten. It was written by Patrick's great-grandson, Edward Fontaine, and is a compilation of Edward's father's recollections. Edward's father was about 20 years old when Patrick died, um, so he certainly would have had a good memory about the death. It also includes other anecdotes um, that he learned about Patrick throughout his life. Fortunately, the manuscript was transcribed by Mark, who's on the call today with us, and it was published in 2011. So based on this source, we know that Patrick Henry was administered mercury in an attempt to save his life. Now, mercury was not an uncommon remedy. Um, the use of mercury actually dates back as early as the Qin Dynasty in China. 
um, from between 221 to 206 BC, the emperor was trying to seek eternal life and so he would drink it. It was also used well into the 1800s as a remedy and even into the 1900s for some diseases. So Dr. Cabell, um, according to Edward Fontaine, knew this was a last resort and Dr. Cabell said, you can only live a short time without it and it may possibly relieve you. According to Fontaine, Patrick then bowed his head sitting in his chair and prayed audibly a childlike fervent prayer for a preparation for death and for the welfare of his family and country. He then swallowed the mercury without any emotion. Fontaine accounts that Dr. Cabell then left the house and wept bitterly under one of the trees in the yard. When Dr. Cabell returned, Patrick was comforting his wife and family weeping around him. Among other things which he said after expressing gratitude for the goodness of God to him for all these days, he added, I feel truly thankful to my heavenly father who after blessing me all my life is permitting me now to die without suffering any pain. And that was on June 6, 1799. Patrick was still viewed very positively in the public eye. An article in the Virginia Gazette after Patrick's death stated, farewell first rate patriot, farewell. As long as our rivers flow or mountains stand so long, will your excellence and worth be the theme of homage and endearment and Virginia, bearing in mind her loss, will say to rising generations, imitate my Henry. So what exactly was important to Patrick Henry when he lived here at Red Hill? What was it that the Virginia Gazette asserted should be imitated about Patrick Henry's life? Based on the sources that we have, it appears that that descriptor would be his virtue. A letter from Patrick's wife, Dorothea, written to his daughter, Elizabeth Aylett, in 1799, is a heartfelt letter from Dorothea explaining to, their, to, to the daughter, Betsy, about how her father passed. And so it says, and the source is there, my loss, my dear Betsy, can never be repaired in this life, but oh, that I may be enabled to imitate the virtues of your dear and honored father, and that my latter end may be like this. He met death with firmness and in confidence that through the merits of a bleeding savior that his sins would be pardoned. Oh, my dear Betsy, what a scene have I been witness to. I wish the great Jefferson and all the heroes of the deistical party could have seen my ever dear and honored husband pay his last debt to nature. John Marshall also wrote to George Washington following the death of Patrick that Virginia has sustained a very severe loss which all good men will long deplore. Patrick's final words, to his family, his friends, and his country, to echo through posterity did not gloat of his fame nor his personal doings. There was an envelope that was found that was to be open upon Patrick's death here at Red Hill. And inside he wrote a copy of his Stamp Act resolves and on the back, he wrote these words. Whether this will prove to be a blessing or a curse will depend upon the use our people make of the blessings which a gracious God hath bestowed on us. If they are wise, they will be great and happy. If they are of a contrary character, they will be miserable. Righteousness alone can exalt them as a nation. Reader, whoever thou art, remember this, and in thy sphere, practice virtue thyself and encourage it in others. So with that, I will turn it back over um, to Dawn for our Q&A session. Wonderful. Well, I've been actually, I've compiled a few of the questions that we've been receiving through the, uh, through the, through the uh, presentation, so I'm gonna, bring a few of those up to us, but thank you guys so much for sharing your research and your understanding of some of these sources. Um, as I believe John uh, Ragosta um, uh, mentioned in the chat, there is no Patrick Henry papers as present. Um, for researchers, we really rely a lot on the, the big projects that have taken place in the last 25 years that have 
and even longer, uh, that have brought together these founding father papers. Um, so uh, I am very much team papers of Patrick Henry. Uh, let's make it happen. <laughs> All right, so the first question um, I want to bring up has to do with sort of the number of enslaved individuals that we know were at Red Hill and at Scotchtown um, versus some some other plantations in the period like George Washington's. Um, uh, it's from Laura, um, I'm just gonna go with Laura, I don't wanna mispronounce your last name. Um, and uh, she says that George Washington had 8,000 acres under cultivation, but had 317 enslaved individuals. Patrick Henry had eight, 8K acres, but less than 100 people. Um, so what do you guys think about that? Where's, where's that difference coming in? Is it the type of things being, Grown? Is it a lack of documentation? So, Mark, I oh, we oh lost no, we Mark. lost Mark. <laughs> I can back. cover this. So, what's really interesting about Red Hills that by the time Patrick died, it was just short of three thousand acres, but very little of that was actually under cultivation at the time. So, a lot of it was still wooded. You also have to remember the amount of cattle that Patrick had. Um, the crops that were grown specifically to feed cattle. And so the, mark your back, so now you can cover this, but <laughs> basically the amount of acres that were being cultivated in tobacco was relatively low compared to the amount of acres that Patrick owned here. I think a similar thing is at play at Scotchtown. Um, when he moves into Scotchtown, um, this is uh, quite a step up in terms of acreage and the, uh, the size of the house itself. Um, so whereas George Washington had a very intensely cultivated, um, highly dense, densely populated enslaved community, um, I think these are, are less so. Um, but yes, you're absolutely fair to create the, the comparison of, of acreage, it's really interesting. Um, so another question, oh no, Mark keeps having some, some issues with connectivity earlier, so hopefully um, he will come back to us. Um, I have a question about um, where did Dr. Cabell travel from when he attended to Patrick Henry over those, those months? Damn it. You back, Mark? No. So Dr. Cabell, um, the Cabell family home was in Lynchburg, which would have been, if, if you take the roads that are there today, it's about 35 miles. So it would have been a pretty hard ride to do in one day on horseback, um, if not two. So it is quite interesting that Dr. Cabell um, attended Patrick those two separate times with being so close in proximity to one another um, within the time frame. So there's another great question about manumission laws um, in Virginia before and after the revolution. Um, so I, if it's okay, I'll, I'll speak to, to what I know of the topic. There may be some who are in attendance today. In fact, I know there are some in attendance today who are very, very well versed on this topic. Uh, so feel free to jump in as well in the chat if you wanna add anything. Um, but there was increasing restrictions um, in the 18th century on uh, your ability to manumit a slave in Virginia. Um, in 1732, uh, they really restricted it so that they, you had to have sort of a meritorious act or cause uh, that was approved by the governor or a council. Uh, so it was definitely considered the exception rather than something that just anyone could do. Um, after the revolution in 1782, there is additional legislation that's, um, that's enacted where individuals, private individuals could uh, manumit their own slaves. So, you know, when you were mentioning Dorothea, that's probably um, the kind of act she was using. Uh, that pendulum starts shifting again as you get into the 19th century. And actually John Marshall, so the John Marshall House is another uh, property that Preservation Virginia cares for. And uh, at his death, he, he technically offers manumission to, um, uh, to Robin Spurlock, who'd been enslaved by him basically both of their adult lives. And, um, but he, because of current laws, has to leave the state. Um, and that, that's a pretty common cause. cause. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Marshall actually offers him passage to Liberia. Uh, so you have this, there's a movement towards that as well. Uh, so it's, it's a pendulum swinging back and forth. 
um, across Patrick's lifetime and into the, the 19th century. What other questions do we have? Oh, got some good ones coming in. Uh, what, if anything, did Jefferson write or speak of Patrick Henry's death? Do you guys know? And it might be a Mark question too, but. Um, I think that's definitely more in Mark's wheelhouse. Okay. Um, but we know that Jefferson was writing about Patrick Henry even after Patrick had passed away, 25 some years or so. Um, from what I know, Jefferson's close to death and is still writing about Patrick Henry. So um, Jefferson's views of him certainly were not high. Oh, great. Um, Mr. Augusta or Dr. Augusta says uh, the 1806 law mandates that any slave freed must leave the state. Okay, gotcha. So that's when that, that swung back towards that. Excellent, very good. So um, let's see here. Another question we got was, did Henry spend more freely at Scotchtown in his efforts to relieve Sarah's despondency? That's a good question, and I think it points again to our, our lack of documentation of what's going on inside of Scotchtown, especially when it comes to Sarah. Um, I think a more likely scenario um, for, the, for the sort of high level of consumption is that he's young, he's on the rise, he's, he's a man who's trying to make his name, and as simple as he was in his taste, um, he was still running in circles where a certain level of hospitality was demanded. Um, the next step he takes is becoming governor. Um, so he's, he's mindful of what material life of a Virginia elite looks like. Um, and I'm sure, you know, some of those purchases on those ledger were for Sarah, but we can't quite tell what is and what isn't. Um, he also has his children there as well. And so his daughter, Martha, although she marries um, kind of in the middle of their time at Scotchtown, um, probably some of the purchases for like pearl necklaces and things like that might have been for her. Um, but we just don't know. Yes, and there's also a lot of extra family members uh, who come and stay with him for extended periods of time to assist in her care. So, so the household is, is fuller, if you will, as well. See here. Another question we have is um, who actually made the purchases on the Newcastle ledger? Was it always Patrick Henry or do we feel like it was a mix of people? Erin, um, what do you think? Um, that's a great question. And I think we do have an example that shows us it certainly was not always Patrick himself. Um, if you recall the slide in my slideshow um, that included a screenshot of the ledger with Pedro's name on it, um, that said uh, to Mrs. or Mr., I think Mrs. though, Mrs. Henry's um, order paid to Pedro. So what we are interpreting this as is that Pedro is more than likely the person who was at the Newcastle store at this time. Um, and who made, perhaps he had a list um, that was sent with him by uh, Sarah um, of things to purchase. Or another possibility is that this was an example of a bill of exchange that he was receiving a certain amount of money to bring back to um, Patrick and Sarah. Um, but yeah, so that's a clear example that it's not always Patrick who's making these purchases, um, but it's all on his sort of account. Another good example is actually on March 23rd, uh, 1774. So the day he's giving the speech in Richmond. So we know where he is <laughs> and he's not in Scotchtown or in Newcastle, um, but somebody purchases several pounds of myrtle wax, which is a plant derived wax that created these really sweet smelling candles. Um, it also was used as sort of a poultice for, um, for surgery and uh, medical purposes. Um, and so, don't know who that was, but somebody somebody bought it on his account on that date. 
Lee, I see a good question here sure. yeah, go um, for it. that would pull in both places. It's um, from Alicia Cohen. Could someone explain the research done on the enslaved at any of the plantations? And I can start um, very briefly. So in 2018, Red Hill, through grant funding, was able to purchase back the area where the enslaved population would have lived. It's called Quarter Place. And we know there are 147 graves down at the cemetery there. Um, we believe it was used in Richard Booker's era through Patrick. Um, and the latest uh, burial that we have recorded is even from the 1930s. So it was used by, of course, the enslaved population and then the free black population after emancipation. And so we are actively looking to figure out who is buried there by finding names. And so far, um, the staff has been able to identify 40 names of individuals that are buried there and are working to find descendants that are still living that can tell us their stories. So Scotchtown. <laughs> That's, that's fantastic. Uh, that's excellent work you guys are doing. Um, we, we like Red Hill are intensely interested in better understanding the lives of the enslaved, uh, learning their names, learning their experiences. Um, to the best of our knowledge, we do not have um, a cemetery space um, that we know was used for um, enslaved burials. Um, but but like, uh, like Caitlin, we would love to hear from you. If you have a connection as a descendant um, please reach out to us. We are getting ready to launch a new project um, in coming months, so stay tuned, <laughs> where we will be trying to share as much information as we have. Um, we rely on court records in a lot of cases, and court records are notoriously um, good at missing people. Um, so we want to hear your stories too. And um, that's an excellent question. Yes, I, I do want to add that there is a an identified burial ground across from Scotchtown, but it is on private property that I believe in 1958 was recorded as an African um, American burial ground. Um, we are assuming that is related to Scotchtown, but again, it's private and so we don't have access to it. Well, with that, it looks like we are at one o'clock and I just want to thank so much, Caitlin, and I'm sure you'll pass it on to Mark as well uh, for you guys uh, partnering with us on this webinar and for all of y'all out there for coming and your comments. And I love looking at the chat and seeing the excellent information that's being exchanged. Um, if you have any additional questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and this uh, recording of this webinar will be put up on YouTube in the next couple of weeks. And uh, so we look forward to that. And I hope all of you guys have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you so much. Take care, y'all.